Yeah, okay, so um, welcome to my session after lunch, and thanks, Torben, for the opportunity to give my or present my work. It's going to be about Docker monitoring, and um, I specifically focus a little bit on, on Slurm to give you an idea what's going on or what, what could be done with uh, the tools I, I created. The agenda looks as follows. So I, first, I will ditch a little bit into Docker, give you a brief overview. For those of you who attended yesterday, the uh, what track was it? Uh, ah, the Galaxy track. Uh, we had a little introduction to Docker already, but I will just briefly touch it. Then I will present the foundations of uh, technologies I use. So that's Clip Terminal, Clip Monitoring, Clip Inventory. And uh, the core of the talk sh is going to be um, Slurm Auto Generated Dashboards and uh, what could be done with it. Um, the slides should uh, last for uh, 45 minutes or so, and then I will uh, spin up a cluster on my laptop and show you a live demo. So please pray for the demo god, but it should be fine. Um, a demo of uh, what I just talked about. So that's me. Um, there are my, my details, and if you would like to have a card, I, can, uh, I have a lot of cards to throw away, so just ask me. Um, I'm, my background is system operations, or I started as a Windows administrator and then iterated towards uh, all the different uh, levels you can you can have. So first a Windows and Mac, then Linux and Linux server administrator at the automotive industry. Then I went to the HPC part of uh, the game, um, operated the 3000 node cluster at Daimler for crash tests. And uh, then I um, went to work for Pool and uh, worked at the R&D department of their HPC business and working on the next-gen interconnect that Pool is proposing. But uh, that was a little bit too conservative to my taste, so I decided to drop out, join a fancy hipster startup in Berlin and uh, do my own startup. So I founded my little uh, company, Clip Solutions, so it's a one-man show. It's, uh, it's an envelope to go to conferences and do my work. Uh, I'm focusing on holistic system management, so providing access and uh, usability of the cluster as in general. Um, and one part of it is that I like to play around with Docker and Linux containers in general, so containerization of uh, the service part and the application part is one of my, um, yeah, my, my loves, let's say. And uh, as well, I do consultancy, software design and development uh, in this space, so I work with a Norwegian startup to uh, provide an InfiniBand monitoring system, and uh, that's what I what I do for a living. Okay, so Docker in a nutshell. Uh, I presented these slides yesterday uh, in this uh, sensitive data session. Um, we have two sides: the traditional virtualization and the containerization, and both of them they are fo uh, founded on a, on a server on physical hardware, and both of them using a kernel, host kernel, so Linux kernel, for instance. Um, then we have a user land on both of these uh, host kernels, and this comprises the operating system. And on the traditional virtualization side, side we, we have a hypervisor. It could be type 2, which is uh, based on the user land, like VirtualBox, or it could be type 1, which uh, <coughs> could be Xen or ESX. And on top of this hypervisor, we provide a fully functional or fully simulated, emulated virtual machine, hence the name virtual machine. And this virtual machine boots up uh, it uses uh, the BIOS and then it starts a kernel as a physical machine as well. Did um, puts a user lamp on a user land on it and puts a service on it that we desire to run in this virtual machine, whether it's an Apache or what, what have you. And uh, it's not only starting the service that you desire to run, but also the complete any system of the of the operating um, operating system. So you will have a syslog and uh, all the other services you have. In uh, containers and containerization, or especially in Docker, you have a little Docker daemon that runs uh, in the user end of the host, and this uh, Docker daemon spawns new <coughs> containers on top of the host kernel itself. So there's no hypervisor involved. You directly uh, sit on top of the host kernel, and that's why um, Linux containers are way faster than traditional virtualization approaches, because you do not have this uh, hypervisor in between. So uh, in this part, for instance, the kernel of the guest uh, sees uh, resources and tries to schedule smart, and the host kernel of the physical machine also tries to schedule smart, and they both don't know about each other, so this cannot be uh, fast, right? 
in the uh, container size uh, user land or the container directly sees um, host kernel resources and there's only one scheduler involved. And on top of this user land, we have this service uh, that we desire to run. And the normal ideal approach in Docker or in containers in general is to um, use only one service and use only one um, one binary to, to start inside of this um, container to keep it small size and um, yeah, to keep it lightweight. <coughs> okay, so another view on, on, on it is that um, containers use kernel namespaces to, to uh, function. There are a couple of them, so pip, next network, mount, and uh, some others. And they encapsulate process groups, basically. So you, uh, in the first container, we run an interactive shell. And on this interactive shell, we use ls minus l or ps minus ef, and we only see processes within this specific container, and we cannot see other processes. Um, if we run the ps minus ef command on the host, then we see all the processes in uh, each of the containers because they are in the process namespace of the host. But each container has its own process namespace for starters. It has its own network. It has its own mount groups and uh, user ID namespace and such. such. So um, the, the isolation is uh, with uh, namespaces and uh, it's a pretty fast virtual machine if you do not want to look at the specifics. It looks like a virtual machine but it's not it's just a group of processes that are independent. Um, this is isolation. Um, if you want to restrain or restrict a container to only use certain um, resources, you can do so by C groups. You can, for instance, tell a container that he's only allowed to run on CPU core 0 or on CPU core 7 or whatever. And you could also tell a container that he's only allowed to use uh, 1 megabyte per second uh, on the file system or network. So all the C groups that you can use in the Linux kernel is applicable in containers, which is pretty cool, pretty fun, because uh, if you have a very aggressive uh, application that used to um, yeah, throw away a lot of uh, memory bandwidth, or, you know, a lot of network bandwidth, you can just restrict this application container to only uh, uh, use such and such resources, and then it will be restrained, which is pretty nice. Um, so that's just uh, two slides. Introduction to Docker. Uh, I'm organi I've organized a half-day workshop at the ISC AI Performance Conference. And uh, we'll be, uh, we will have a deeper dive into the specifics and not only touching on Docker as a Linux container um, uh, technique, but also on Rocket, I think we will touch on that as well, but I don't want to go into specifics here. And um, I've worked, uh, I've done some, some research the last year or so, um, uh, looking, doc looking into Docker on the system or service side, and also looking into Docker from the HPC workload side, so I run uh, Docker containers using MPI and Docker containers uh, running open foam. And so I, I have done some stuff at the end of the presentation. I have a link to my blog there. I elaborate on that. Yeah, and I will further discuss what we discussed today. And uh, one Docker workshop is not enough. There's another conference, I see Cloud and Big Data on the 28th of September, and this will be a full day workshop. Um, and there will be also a workshop at the ISC uh, in Austin, but I think Austin is not Nordic. Uh, so. Um, yeah, this, uh, there are some Docker workshops we are, we are providing. For. <coughs> so, Knip Terminal. Um, Knip Terminal is, uh, yeah, I, I created it out of the desire to run a complete HPC stack on my laptop. And I first started using VirtualBox, but VirtualBox, after you spin up four machines, uh, yeah, it, it's not very performant anymore. So, I put it aside, and after couple of months I revisited it because I uh, read about Docker and I thought, okay, that would be a cool use case to try it out. And uh, what I did, I, um, I use Docker now for uh, spinning up a complete cluster. This would be one example uh, in which I spin up a Slurm uh, cluster, a little Slurm cluster. I use Consul as a foundation of uh, Clip Terminal. Who knows Consul? One. Come on. No. Okay. Well, you have to, you have to check out Consul. Consul is... Uh, it's a key value store, a distributed key value store. It also provides uh, health check functionality, so you can uh, put a Docker daemon, uh, sorry, a console daemon on, on a couple of machines. They will all connect to form a console cluster. And if you provide a health check on one of the nodes, then this service will be propagated throughout the whole cluster, and you can access this, uh, this server by using a DNS service entry. So that's pretty uh, nice, pretty interesting. 
and uh, that works. It worked like a charm. Before this, I used etcd and some bash scripts to provide the same functionality, but console is like it's awesome. Um, so this notation is uh, just a YAML notation to um, orchestrate uh, Docker containers. So you, you instead of running Docker and then uh, providing the name of the of the image, which ports you want to export, with DNS service you want to use, and such, you just provide this uh, YAML file and then you fire up fig up and it will start each container. And you can also link together containers, but I don't want to go too much into details. Um, as I said, you can only you just imagine it's a fast virtual machine. <laughs> and um, so I spin up this cluster. I have two uh, nodes, uh, three nodes, one console node, one Slurm master, and one Slurm client. Uh, and through console, you got a very um, nice uh, looking UI, uh, yeah, UI where you can look at the different services running on the, within the cluster, and you can look at the nodes and look at the key value store. And uh, when I fired up the cluster, I could also scale up certain parts of the, of the uh, orchestration. So in this case, I start the three nodes, then I scale up the Slurm D, so the clients, to five. And after a couple of seconds, I um, logged into the first Slurm node, and I can use um, my partition in Slurm and run jobs on it and um, use it like a Slurm cluster is supposed to, like, to run. So yeah, this is uh, the terminal. Um, yeah, you can you can use it to to run uh, all kinds of services. So I have I think I don't know 20 or so uh, Docker images on on Docker Hub, and I try to put a fig file in every in each uh, in each Docker repository to be able to spin up the whole stack without uh, looking into readmes or, or such. So just do fig up and then off you go. And based on that, I extended uh, Knip Terminal in a way that I, I'm, I use uh, Logstash and uh, Kibana Elasticsearch and uh, performance stack to provide uh, a stack of, for uh, performance management or performance monitoring and syslog events. And uh, this I call Knip Monitoring because I think current monitoring system, or at least the ones I saw, um, they are not very connected. They are derived of a specific need and uh, then historically grown mostly. And, and they do not overlay metrics with uh, log events, for instance. Uh, they are not very connecting all the dots that are provided by the various systems. And uh, yeah, the inventory systems are same uh, same bunch. They are mostly also uh, derived on a specific need and not very well connected. And um, yeah, the, the other thing is that the user, user perspective of the, of the systems is not very taken into account. So there are various users, various expertise, various uh, ages and uh, backgrounds, and this should be taken into account as well. So what Knip Monitoring provides, it provides an open metric system using the Graphite uh, framework. There is a big in, uh, ecosystem around uh, metrics. Who of you knows Graphite and the ecosystem? So I like to like I like you, <laughs> and uh, okay. So this is uh, I will show this as well. The uh, log event framework I use uh, Logstash, so the ERK stack. Also, who knows Logstash and the bunch? You two guys again. Yeah, and for auto discovery and configuration, I I use console. Okay, so have a look at the Logstash. Um, this is Kibana, which is a JavaScript uh, framework to to look at the um, back end of, of Logstash. And logstash is basically just a pipeline for strings, for log events. So you can send syslog, or you can forward syslog directly to logstash. That's what I'm doing in my, uh, what I've done in my, in my keep terminal. And this uh, log, when it's emitted, it will be forwarded to logstash. Logstash will process it, and then uh, put it in Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch is a very cool store for it, because it's a Lucene-based uh, text indexing database where you can very fast search for text, and so this is pretty nice to um, to view <coughs> log events. For performance, I use uh, Grafana. Grafana is uh, uh, the front end for the graphite, or one front end for the graphite uh, ecosystem. You can send uh, arbitrary metrics to the system. It will be stored in a time series database and flat files. And uh, Grafana is just a way to display this uh, metrics information. And the cool thing about Grafana is that you can not only can display metrics, but also can overlay uh, log events out of Elasticsearch. So you can, for instance, this is one Slurm job, and I will show it in the demo. 
Um, this job just copies, uh, allocates some file, then copies it over to another node, and uh, each of these lines are just uh, syslog events emitted by the application that I'm running using Slurm. So within the Slurm script, there are just some logger events that uh, sends the log event to Logstash, and uh, Grafana uses this information to overlay context to, um, to the networking metric here. And this is a very clean networking metric since I'm, I'm using Docker, there's no uh, noise. And, I mean, you can imagine if some administrator updates the system or someone logs in and someone backs up something, this won't be that clean. And I think uh, even in, the clean th uh, in a clean way, it's hard to figure out what the context of this metric is. And uh, with log, with log uh, overlayment, you can figure out context. And this is, I think, uh, something that we need in uh, data center management, um, that there is an easier way and easier access to the information available in the system. Um, and um, with, uh, with Fabriscase, so the, the, the guys uh, over in Norway where I work on the InfiniBand monitoring, um, I had a use case to create my own inventory, yet, not yet another hopefully. Um, I use a graph database. Uh, in this specific case, I use Neo4j, which is just um, a nice uh, entry point because it has uh, all batteries included. You have a GUI and you have a, a very uh, interesting language to query it. So this is uh, the network topology of a simple InfiniBand cluster within the um, within Neo4j, which is this graph database. And to this cipher cipher queries, which are basically, if you look at it, it looks like SQL. You can query different aspects of the graph database. And I would like to put all the, or most of information that I can get hold on into this graph database. So the first one was network topology. I would also like to put in uh, software uh, information. So which software was installed when, which version, and who installed it, and stuff like that. So I think we, we have something to talk about at the barbecue. Um, and as well, sure, uh, slow cluster information. So this would be the, the graph of uh, jobs running and uh, associated to different uh, nodes. And this I, uh, I worked on uh, the last two days, so it's, uh, it's not, not, not long development phase, but uh, still I think I have uh, done some quite nice things to visualize. And what you could also do with this creep inventory is to enrich logs. So if you get this log line from uh, OpenSM, it will show you a MAC address kind of thing from your network card, and it will show you some, some lit, but this MAC address, one could say, uh, is not very helpful if you would like to to look at specific infinite event from a host because you cannot know or you you won't know all the different IDs of your of your system. So what you want to have is you want to refine the logs to know okay this was host ACA two with port one and then you might even add uh, an attribute to this log line that it's called okay the source of the of the uh, connection was HCA2, and what I haven't done, but uh, what's easily to add is that you add also the information to which switch this host was connected to, and if you uh, have a problem with the switch, for instance, then you could even uh, look at this uh, log information and get information of uh, log events that are emitted by hosts that are connected to the switch, which also could lead to errors, right? So you want to look for, uh, look into your logging system with all the connected dots, and you do not want to fit around and try to figure out the context um, by yourself. Okay, so, um, and what it also done, and it, uh, what it also do is, uh, it's a pretty easy visualization, so, um, so who of you are working with InfiniBand? Well, oh, handful. Um, most of the times, um, you do not have much clue how your network looks like, even if it's, if it's a clause 3 or clause 2 network, which is uh, pretty straightforward, then it's easy, but I've seen a lot of installations where the administrators uh, do not care much because InfiniBand mostly works and they just plug uh, cables into switches where just the port is free. So they do not know what the exact layout of the system is. They just plug it in, then run a test job. If the test job doesn't suck at all, then okay, let's keep it this way. And this I, I've seen many times. So uh, with this tool, you can just uh, visualize it on the fly. And um, what I also want to do is to build history about the networking. So in this case, we have two switches, which are the ASICs here, and all the green parts are uh, physical devices. So we have ports that are connected by cables, and this connection is a logical node inside of the graph. 
And the current connection is this, but uh, the old connection before this connection was this, so this cable was associated to this part. And by building up this history in the graph, you can easily look for or query the, the graph database to show you which port leads to an error or if the cable was a problem, so that meaning that the, the cable, uh, the error went with the cable or the error sticks to the port. So this um, could be a very uh, easy way and interesting way to look at problems. Because I was a two-year InfiniBand administrator myself, I brought my bachelor thesis about uh, InfiniBand monitoring and yeah, I felt the pain myself and I <laughs> am willing to solve it. And I think this could be one step in the right direction. Okay, but uh, let's look into the cluster use case um, I wanted to, to show you. I think we have to consider multiple backgrounds when we create visualizations or information platforms for our end users. So we have three kinds of, of users, at least from my perspective, we have the end user, which is the engineer, sci the scientist or software developer. We have the operation personnel and we have management, at the Excel layer I call them. Uh, and then we have also to take into account the psychology or around this different uh, background. So if you have a problem and it's imminent, then you might throw away all your acquired knowledge and just focus on your core knowledge and, and uh, take into account your mental model of the system you're administrating. But if the system that provides you with information uses a different model than your mental model of your system, then it's hard to figure out what the problem is because you always have to translate the model from the system that provides you information to your own mindset and then you try to figure out and come up with hypotheses and try to figure out what the problem really is. So there are, and there are also <coughs> different um, ways of looking at a system. When nothing's going on, you might want to have a 10,000 feet view overview of your system. If you have a hypothesis you want to verify, then you need uh, to drill down into metrics. And if you just want to have a report what's what's going on last, day or last week, then you use some reporting um, tools. And in essence, I think the tools should empower users to take into account their local knowledge and their experience and provide tools to uh, extend this uh, capability. Because uh, if you have 30 years experience with SED and AWK, then and, and you're scared when someone comes around uh, with, uh, with 20 something years and says, okay, yeah, you have to click here and here and here, and then you see what's going on. So this, this is scary to most of the people. So we, we have to provide a low entry point and we have to make, take care of the implications that the people have felt when we introduce such tools. So my cluster use case is just a small cluster. I have five nodes or so six, uh, two user groups and a couple of users associated to these groups. And I have small, uh, two simple use cases, workloads, one is the script. We've already seen the networking load. It uh, copies a file from one node, from the first node of the Slurm uh, job to the other nodes. And the other script is uh, a matrix multiplication without the actual multiplication. It just sleeps for a couple of milliseconds, which uh, provides a nice pattern, but does not uh, impose much load on my system, because otherwise it would be hard. Um, this is uh, the, the parts of the system that I already showed in the introduction to Creep Terminal. So the boxes are um, containers and the round shaped ones are the services that are the, the reason for this container. So I have console as a service backend and then I have a Slurm master and a couple of uh, Slurm clients to, um, to run the, the different uh, workloads. Alongside, uh, here we see the, the, um, the example from the previous slide. Uh, alongside this, I have some performance containers. I use Carbon, Graphite API, and Grafana to visualize it, store it, and provide an API to it. Um, then I use uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana for, uh, as a Logstash or a, a logging pipeline. A cop is just to, to look into Elasticsearch specifics. And uh, as an inventory, I, I use uh, Neo4j and um, a tool or a service that interacts with Neo4j. And since I learned about the Galaxy yesterday, I uh, added a Galaxy node, not yet in Postgres, but uh, uh, I think maybe someday, uh, someday in the future. Um, yeah, and in this uh, I added. It's not very uh, incorporated because I, I have to, to change some things, but uh, anyway. And uh, yeah, coming to the contexts, I think the first context I want to look at is the management context. So the management uh, might want only have to, to have a live status. Um, just looking at the utilization, looking at 
which users are running which jobs, how much nodes are allocated, how much nodes are idle, how much nodes are uh, failing. Um, then maybe verifying that the SLA is met by the system operations, that it maybe is uh, subcontracted, so have some insights about that, and then um, have a look at most common jobs that you can yell at someone uh, after lunch, I don't know, misbehaving end users, so this kind of information. Um, another aspect will be reports, for sure, to have a, the last day as a review or a report or the um, information about users or job types. And uh, also capacity planning, so that you could show the utility, uh, utilization over time and the utilization of your file system over time, and then uh, plan ahead for the next couple of months or years to think about what you need. And also comparison of new hardware, so if you get a test system from another vendor, then you can say, okay, I put it next to the old one, and then I uh, run some test jobs, and with this graphs, you can easily profile the jobs running on the different systems and uh, get an yeah, indication of which node is good, which node is bad. Um, this is a Slurm dashboard I, I came up with. So um, we have here the jobs in the queue. So the green ones are the pending jobs, the yellow ones are the running jobs. Then uh, on the left side, uh, bottom, we, we see uh, the nodes allocated per user, and here we see the nodes allocated per, per group. Um, then we have links to the running jobs and the most recent finished jobs, so these links are clickable. And then you can go to a dashboard that only focuses on a specific job. And uh, this is uh, something I, I, I created with uh, Matplotlib to just visualize the placing of the jobs. So this is a fake because I don't have a, a close two network here, a three network. It's just an example. And by this you can easily spot if your uh, workload is misplaced. So for instance, this here we see that we have three nodes running in a cluster or in a job that uh, are not balanced. So they don't uh, have the same hop size, uh, hop, hop uh, count to each other and the same goes for the purple job. So this is an easy spot to, to look at this. And if you click on the picture, you see it in big. Um, you see the name of the, of the node, and I just put the um, job ID here. But there could be other, uh, other things displayed. Or it could be even a SVG um, visualization where you can hover over, and then you see metrics. So, so yeah, this could be extended quite far, I think. Um, also, due to the inventor, I have scripts that are uh, propagating the status of Slurm into the graph database. So in this case, we see we have six nodes, and we have three different uh, partitions. One partition connects all, it's called all. And then I have an odd and an even uh, partition, which uh, allocates a different uh, nodes. So the odd nodes are in the odd partition, the even nodes in the so partition. And um, jobs are also connected to this uh, graph. So uh, I can see that this job here in the middle, when I hover over it, I see it's completed. Uh, one of uh, these two, uh, I assume, are running. And um, this is one example of the uh, Cypher query I use. So as you know SQL, it's pretty uh, easy to spot how this works. And um, yeah, this is um, another dashboard. Uh, it's uh, the PROC dashboard where you can see how many processes are running in the different containers. <coughs> so these are all the processes on the service nodes, on the service containers. And these are the processes on the different um, compute nodes. So the non-root processes. So one measurement might be that if you have a cluster uh, that only one user at a time is uh, allowed to run on a, uh, on a specific node, because otherwise you would indicate that there is some zombie running around, some zombie process from a previous job <coughs> running around on this node. So you want to check that you have uh, only one user on a specific node. And on the, the bottom, uh, they will see all non-root processes by user. So this is, uh, I think it's Bob, and this is... Uh, Carol or something, or Jane. So uh, this shows the different usages of different users. The end user might um, want to have a look at the live process of his job. So he uh, submits a job, and then he wants to visualize and uh, follow what uh, is the different uh, status or what's the iteration speed of your job. So he wants to look at it. Uh, and I think for starters, if you are new to a certain program, you just want to get a gut feeling on how this job behaves if you submit it. So this could be easily spotted with this. You got a graph about network performance or system performance or logs or what have you. And also introduce your own uh, application profiling into it. So um, a log event, create a log event is as easy as submitting something to this log. 
creating a metric is as easy as uh, putting a key value a timestamp string to a certain TCP port or a UDP port if you uh, care about performance and don't care about the uh, security or the, the transmission. And uh, this could lead to enhanced feedback that you you are faster in your iteration speed because you know what your job is doing. Or if you uh, want to know what's, what's happening to a job, um, you could get a detailed report about uh, jobs finishing or jobs failing or jobs completion or what have you. And um, also uh, something that might be considered um, that you, you, you run uh, optimizations that are um, automated. So if your next iteration depends on the previous iteration and you want to gather if the job might be uh, only uses 16 megabytes or 60% 60, 60 of your memory, then the next iteration should uh, have an increased uh, resolution to, uh, to utilize the memory better, and then you can iterate towards an optimal job without interacting because it's a feedback loop. And uh, the Slurm dashboard for, for one job might look like this. So you see uh, the same job map, but you only see your own uh, job here. The others are gray. And you see the network uh, traffic, and I, I added the context switches here just to have a metric. Um, and this are, and I think I have this on the next slide. This is uh, the log submitted by the log script, so we see which command was used to run the MPI job, and there could be um, more verbose information here, the environment maybe, or whatever. And at the end, I submit a job that the job was uh, finished. Yeah, and this is, <laughs> I've changed the. I just, uh, <laughs> this is job 15 and jobs 10 that's n not in line, but I, I copied the, the thing and it changed the board, anyway. Um, then the sysops uh, context, um, maybe you want to have a live status where you can use at certain aspects of the cluster that you maybe use a method like use, where you look at the utilization, the saturation, and the error counters to get a feeling of how your uh, cluster is behaving. Um, you might want to do anomaly detection without or with human interaction, and uh, I think for, for starters, uh, human, with human interaction is the easiest because humans are very good in spotting uh, abnormality. So if you show a graph and there's one outlier, it's easy to spot for a human, but it's not easy to spot for, a, for, um, for, a, for an algorithm. And yeah, spotting abnormal behavior, I think it's uh, one of the key features. And for this, you have to drill down into the monitoring, not only displaying a static page where you can see this graph and this graph, um, like you have with RD tool back in the days, where you can create a metric and put it into RD tool, but you can only visualize what you put in there and logic that you put in there. You cannot overlay different RD tool graphs. You have to come up with a new RD tool file, RD file to create a new visualization of your graphs. And with, with Graphite, it's easy to click and uh, get this metric and this metric and overlay them in the same graph. It's uh, very easy. And I can show this in the demo. Since we are perfect in time, I think that's uh, likely. Yeah, um, and you can correlate events, metrics, and inventory. I showed this already. And uh, I think also you, it could be guiding you towards uh, known problems. If you have a wiki that is connected to the metrics, um, then you, you can have a very easy access to um, problems and tell the administrator, okay, look at this uh, wiki page. We include uh, already all the metrics um, that you need, so you can render these graphs in PNG and include it with a link, so it's easy to um, access it through a wiki or another external page. And this could provide close feedback loops, I think, and provide confidence for that's uh, one, one big part of it. That, you do not uh, have a shaky hand if you click something because you have a generic feedback. So this uh, is how Kibana looks like. You have the, the logs here. You can click on them. Uh, it's, uh, it's a JSON, so uh, it gives you more information if you click. And yeah, I just added Galaxy. That's a bootstrap installation. And I had all this, all these tools. I, I'm not wanting. I mean, maybe someone with Galaxy uh, experience can can help me out to make a hello world out of it. But yeah, and I think Galaxy, yeah, I would like to try it out, as, as, as I already mentioned. Uh, put it, I already connected it to Slurm, but I have to install the plugins, I think, somehow. But um, what could be part of it is um, you could just model and assess workflow out of, uh, out of Galaxy, maybe, where you gather information, and since you have this nice GUI where you can define all these different steps in the workflow, 
it could be very easy to or very uh, nice to to model this workflow in the workflow of Galaxy and then just trigger this workflow to uh, happen uh, to work every once in a while. And you might even use this to uh, to use idle compute resources and do a big data data mining job on your compute cluster when it's not used by the normal units. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's the slide part. Uh, I think we, we could uh, have some questions. And if the, we finish with the questions, then I will show it as a small demo. Yeah, this is an overview. And you can have uh, all the, the blog posts. I have a blog where I put some, some blog posts about the stuff I'm already talked about. And I will create a blog post about this talk, I think, as well. And as I mentioned, I will put it on YouTube if my equipment works as uh, expected. And um, yeah, I have some papers written about, or not papers, I should call it documented, uh, or structured documented documentation because it's not peer reviewed, so it's not paper really. Uh, but I, I will put it there. Yeah, and uh, you, yeah, feel free to ask questions now or later at the barbecue or throughout the week. And if you like to, to have a demo on your own, so a private exclusive demo, it's no problem. I can spin it up in seconds, not minutes, every time. Okay, Tom. Yeah, so uh, my perspective, since this is user uh, support, is, is uh, I'm very interested in what you call performance there. This one. Yeah. So where you sort of gather various types of, of performance data, and you can overlay that and, and view that, and you could even make a per user entry to that. Yeah. Um, which is something that I think is, is, is missing very much. Yeah. Uh, so users, very often they, they start a, a job based on some recipe that maybe we provide as, as, as service providers or maybe they made it up themselves and then, then that job runs, they get out their scientific result and then, oh, fine, it worked, I'm happy. But there is never any feedback from the system as to whether they could have gotten to that same result with less resources yeah. Um, in any way, there is no such feedback, and um, I mean, so this might be something that could be helpful in that context. Yeah, and I think um, there is some solution to to for this problem, right? You can configure Slurm in a way that profiles it, uh, that profiles the system while the job is running, so you, you have it like uh, yeah attached to the job scheduler. But I think it should be a system that is very fundamental to the the cluster and not introduce some profiling that is introduced by some other tools. No, it should be generic. It yeah, should exactly. really just monitor stuff and then, but overlaid with Slurm information and yeah. so, so the user can, can check, okay, this job I just ran now or last <coughs> week, um, where I got my scientific results, now I have a hundred more similar jobs. Was that a good setup I used? Was it a good choice of allocation and runtime parameters yeah. I used for that? Uh, or should I change stuff? Yeah. And, and today it's very difficult for users to, to do anything like that. It's, it's based on experience and it's only if you're interested in, in that you actually build up that experience. Yeah. Exploring various runtime options, is exploring whether this runs real, well across 10 nodes or across 20 nodes. Many jobs will run on either. It's just it, it just simply is a different percentage of the actual utilization that you get out. Yeah. yeah, and you can get mental on this. You can get totally NSA and maybe you submit a job that checks periodically if you submit a certain job that the logs are clean and that the metrics are as you expect them. So maybe you as an experienced user, you know how this job should behave and what are red flags. If this log is submitted that you think, okay, I think your job might break in an hour so that you can raise flags as an experienced user and guide users to, towards the journey of a, a new workload by just providing uh, the, the ecosystem and, and data mining the output of certain jobs and uh, I think that, yeah, there's plenty of things one could talk and think about and uh, I think that's just... Um, but how much yeah. do you have, so, so what, what are the requirements for setting something? If, if if at our side we now say, okay, we want to go ahead with something like that, and we want to uh, try to set up something that would provide our users with a window into their what I would call, what I have called utilization, mm -hmm. uh, which is I think it is mostly in your uh, performance box there. 
what dependencies does this have? What will we have to do in order to to get something like this up and running? You, you need internet access, so you need to download the images and you need to run Docker, and that's basically it. I run it on my laptop, so all the images I use are on, on GitHub, and they are also on, on, uh, hub, uh, on, the, on the Docker Hub. So if you install Docker, and then you do you do install or you do fetch this fig file that I talked about, then you could just tell, say docker pull and it will uh, acquire all the images needed. And if you do docker pick up, then it will start this exact cluster and then you're up and running. It's uh, on one single machine and you have some Java tools here. You have uh, Elasticsearch and you have Logstash and you have Neo4j, which are quite, well, not quite heavily um, in, in resources. If you have a small installation like on the laptop, then it's totally fine. But if no, you but actually, I was thinking about using, I mean, how, how getting something like this up on a real cluster. I think uh, it's, uh, you have to think about where you place the different parts, but since console connects everything, it, it's, it's fairly easy to, to distribute it uh, over multiple machines. And uh, I did it on AWS. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to set up. And um, I think that's, uh, it's, it's ready to be explored. I, I'm not saying that it's ready for production. I think there are some caveats that you have to think about. Uh, you have to think about Elasticsearch uh, storage and Elasticsearch in itself. It's it's very inconvenient for most users, I think, because it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a text database. So, but how how would you then propose that that? Oh, for example, most of the log data is is local to each server, right? And mm -hmm. you need to somehow pull this all together. Yeah, since I use Logstash, Logstash has a lot of plugins. I use uh, the basic syslog uh, plugin as an input, and I specify uh, on each of the nodes, I specify that syslog should forward to Logstash, and that's about it. So then the logs are uh, piped into Logstash, and Logstash has some rules to um, manipulate the logs and enrich them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then they are stuck into Elasticsearch, and then you can visualize it. So that's for the logging part. The performance part is basically the same. Uh, console gives me uh, a DNS entry for Carbon, so I can just send my logs to uh, it's my, my performance information to carbon.service.console, and then it will automatically find its way magically to this uh, container, and the container consumes the logs, stores it into files, so into Carbon Whisper files, and then the Graphite API and Grafana is able to visualize it. And this, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think, it should be fairly. <coughs> Uh, automatic, out of the box. Working. Can you extend something like this with the um, like? Um, so, what are the metrics that you're getting there in your performance? So, what, um, what I use what? on my containers. I use Diamond, which is uh, one Python, uh, one Python version of Collect D or the Collect L. So, which is just a little Python script. Collect it does Collect L, for example. Yeah, and and all the major uh, Collect daemons, they have an interface to to. To carbon, so carbon consumes the key of the metric, like system, uh, then system name, CPU load, for instance. Did you use like, like the perf? For, I mean, the, the perf top. I mean, I can. Uh, I will. I will stop this here, and and then I will go to the demo. If I'm getting to know, I stop it. Let me click. Hello? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, plenty of tools. To, so you can you could even use uh, uh, Collect D or Collect contr Control, or you could use PCM as a performance profiler, or you could use Diamond, and you could use there are plenty of tools that directly report to Carbon, so it's pretty easy. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the simplest problem, I think, to, to set this up. But it depends. I mean, uh, some customers, they, they sell and yell at you if you want to provide or introduce some tools like CollectD because they say, no, I don't want to run any daemon than my job. So I mean, there's problems you might have. Um, if you, you uh, want to perf the performance information of uh, InfiniBand, that's fairly easier because you can only query the switch ports and then you have the performance metrics of the nodes without touching the nodes, so it's um, uh, way easier. And as I said, I'm working with, uh, with uh, Fabi Scale, which is a, a spin-off of uh, Simula, and we are working on a 
performance metric tool that uses exactly this um, metric system. So this logs and this uh, performance metric system as a backend. So this would be easy pluggable into it. And everything I use is open source. Everything I create is open source. And um, yeah, that's... Um, so because we've been running Collector for ages um, on our systems, but the trick that... The, 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 where it stops is getting it all together and overlaying it with slurm information. Mm -hmm. Because that's where it sort of stops for us. Okay, yeah, effort. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I will show you how, how to how to put metrics in uh, in carbon. It's, it's easy as pie. Just mm -hmm. use a while loop in bash and echo something and forward it to a certain port and uh, off you go. So that's uh, that's very easy. So this is all the nodes I'm, I'm running here. Um, uh, that's a little bit small size here, but yeah, they are running. They are about uh, 15 or so. And since I use console, I have a very easy accessible dashboard here. Um, so this is the console dashboard. And if I uh, have a look at it, I see that there are two services among the services um, I, I use that are not up and running yet. And if I look at the nodes, I see that the logstash daemon or the logstash node has some errors. Oh no, it's finished, so everything is green. So now my cluster is up and running, and I can use all the different things. For instance, I could look at the, the logs, and maybe I can get rid of this here. Can have a look at the logs. So now I see all the logs of the system. There are some tools that are emitting a lot of logs, so I can filter them easily out by just clicking here. So this will add a filter that um, that filters out this program slurm stat. Then I can do the same for slurm dash. This are the demons creating the slurm dashboards and the slurm statistics towards uh, Neo4j. So I do this here, then I have a more clean way. And then I see that here is some error, but errors are normal. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. You can see you you can easily see what's what's going on here, and we see that there is errors. So maybe we change to some other dashboard. No, but that's pretty easy to to spot errors here. So um, my generic dashboard for the system is just the network incoming and outgoing traffic, which is pretty boring. Um, if I click here, I get to the Slurm dashboard, which provides me with a, with an overview here. So I see that there are, since there's no Slurm job running, the Slurm dashboard is not created yet. And we can change this by running a job. So I, I use my alias to log into a node. And by login, um, with Docker exec, which was introduced, I think with one dot something, 12 or 13, you could introduce a new process to this process group that I, I, I showed you. So it's like the SSH, but not SSHing into a server, just creating another process within the Docker container, which is pretty uh, awesome, I think. So now I'm inside of the container, and you see only the processes of the, of the container. And if I look at uh, the general commands here from Slurm, we can see I have uh, three different um, partitions, one with all the nodes, one with odd, and one with even nodes. And I have prepared some fancy generate script, and I think I put it even in the yeah, in here. That just submits some uh, some jobs. So I have this ping pong job, which just um, which just copies or uh, allocates first uh, allocates first uh, a file, and then copies the file to where is it here? Erzings Erzings the file to each of the other nodes, which is um, pretty basic, and um, the matrix multiplication file, it's similar, so I use a simple slurm run, so I use this command here, and just do an MPI run, and um, off you go. Okay, so this should um, be in the, yeah, we see here three nodes are running, uh, three jobs are running, from Job Bob and Jane. If I look at the slurm, Dashboard again, I can see the, the job map here, so I see the different placements, which are fake, as I said, but uh, still we have some placements. And we can see the different uh, utilizations here. We have 14 pending jobs, six running, and we can see the utilization of the different nodes, and also per group. And if I click on this uh, dashboard of the job, then I can see the different 
metrics of the job. I can see that we get here and I can zoom here in easily. I can see uh, this log line, this log line, and this log line. And so that's, um, that's pretty easy to do. Um, what else? I got this proc dashboard somewhere here, which shows um, the processes. And since I'm using the same kernel, I use the same proc file system. So if I use for load, uh, if I look for load average, for instance, then I see the load average on all systems are the same because they use the same kernel, and so that's useless to show something else. And yeah, so this is, I, to mock up the system with system metrics in Docker, it's yeah, cumbersome because every every container sees the same amount of um, uh, of memory, and so yeah, you have to work around it. So this is a little bit little bit uh, arbitrary or. Um, uh, I hacked around a little bit to, to show something uh, nice, but if it's on a real system, then you can even see all the different uh, performance metrics and um, the disk utilization and such and such. Yeah, but um, maybe I, I could show you how to create a new metric. So I will create a new dashboard here. Or any other questions so far? While I'm typing, so I will create Uh, test metric and this is a notation so you the key of the metric is just uh, strings um, and separated by a dot and then you you can choose a value so I use random here and then I, I want to have the Unix timestamp and for this I use this funny command and then I sleep for let's say five seconds and this will be sent when I edit the send command the NC command this will be sent to um, to graphite or to carbon, and carbon stores it um, in the, in the time series database. So I send it to carbon dot service dot console. So I don't care where it is because um, console will give me a DNS interface. I can just use this like this, and maybe I should add a, a timeout since I use TCP, but. Just for the sake of it, so let's, let's put a timeout here. So this will send every five uh, seconds. It will send uh, uh, a metric, and um, just to for those of you who are not familiar with with graphite, here. Um, if I Log into where is the carbon thing here? Now I have an alias here. So carbon stores it as uh, whisper files. So it's valid carbon whisper. And then you got test, and then you get this test whisper file. And if you do fast fetch, pretty. Then I have a I, I store it for one day every second, every five seconds, every second, every five seconds. So we can see here every five seconds, right? And this is the value stored in the whisper file. So whisper files are one metric, one file, not as RD tool where you can put a lot of metrics in and um, you do not get them out. I had uh, in the InfiniBand group of uh, of the company I work for, since I put it on YouTube, I should not uh, disclose it. They um, they have a, a cool tool, and I'm very, uh, I'm very jealous, uh, jealous about this tool, where they fetch a lot of infinite metrics and put them into RD tool, and they're putting it at speeds of 10 thousands per second into RD tool. But when I ask, okay, how do you get it out? How do you visualize it? It was like, I don't care now. I want to push as much metric to RD tool as I can, but. And they used uh, uh, um, uh, memory, uh, a memory RAM disk to store it, and so they pushed 50,000 metrics a second, but uh, there was no chance to visualize it properly. So better, better do it otherwise. Okay, so let's uh, have another look. None. So we have a lot of metrics here, and if I go back to my dashboard, I can add another graph. I can make it better for the eye to use the light one. And what I do is just I choose um, the the metrics engine. So I played around with uh, InfluxDB, but this doesn't matter here. And then I can just choose from this uh, keys that I have put into uh, Carbon. So I choose I choose the testing, and then I choose this other testing, 
I give me the last 50 minutes and then I have the metric available and this uh, could be done and I, I do it here with a simple bash script you could use Python libraries or what have you libraries for every programming language out there there is a library to put it into carbon or you can just use a TCP connection to put it into it and um, there's also something uh, as a metrics cache, so you, you want to use statsd for some things, but that's uh, beyond the point, I think. Um, and if you want to submit a log, it's just... Uh, and this I didn't, I haven't tested, but it should work. So my syslog configuration, it's pretty easy. It just forwards to this uh, service that is provided by console. Uh, it's sends it to the, the log search port. And um, we should see the metric here. So if I refresh, and I see this metric here. And um, yeah, carbon or uh, log stash, all this stuff I, I presented, it's a talk of an hour by itself, but um, Logstash, which I use as a pipeline, it's pretty powerful because you have a lot of parts you can use. You can use, I think, around 20 or 30-ish inputs. So you could use 0MQ, you could use RabbitMQ, you could whatever you like, uh, use whatever you like. And you can have you have filters which apply certain functions on top of this met metrics uh, uh, events. So I use the 0MQ um, plugin to push it to uh, this, and, and every every event is a JSON blob, so I use a 0MQ a plugin to push this JSON blob to an external script. This script runs it against uh, Neo4j, looks for updates or not, and if this script's finished, then it pushes this uh, JSON blob back, and from there on, Logstash takes it uh, further and then uh, puts it into, uh, into Elasticsearch. And uh, this inventory lookup thing d indicates that there was no lookup made by the inventory script, but it was pushed to the inventory script and uh, pushed towards the elastic side. Yeah, uh, let's have a look. How are the jobs going? I think they should be finished by now. Oh, it was a long runner. <coughs> Yeah, the dashboard, the update script, um, it's a little little hacked, I admit, because I, I have to render this, this graph, and uh, there should be an easy way to render it, but I fall back to uh, matplotlib and graphics, so this is a pretty heavy process to render the graphs. So this is why the, took, the, the, the script uh, has, to, has to loop in 15 seconds or 10 seconds, and if it's running longer, then you do not get the metrics back every 15 seconds, but every 30 seconds. So this is why this, um, this is not as up-to-date as it should be. But anyway, I think that's just a detail. Yeah. So this job should be finished. Yeah, there are other jobs running, so that we get the access or the, the information here. But we only get the annotation, then maybe I could show, show the annotations here. So you have this uh, little sneaky thing. If you look at the annotations, it's very easy. You just uh, choose a name, which is indicated here. You choose a data source, so I use Elasticsearch. Then I tell him which index to use. So index is kind of the DB in, uh, in a RDBS. And then I use a Lucene query to tell him, okay, I would like to have only um, only logs admitted with a program slurm out, which is what the scripts are admitting. And then I want to filter for the job ID 2, since it's job ID 2. And then I define how the uh, how the uh, annotation look like. And if I click here, then I can overlay. And, uh, and this could be much richer, I think. And this tool, Grafana and Kibana as well, they are also open source. So I'm not a big uh, JavaScript guy, but if if one uh, is able to write some JavaScript code, you could hack this easily. And there are certain plugins for this frameworks to provide your own visualizations. But what we what's already in there, I think it's plenty to to start um, start this work. Okay, and as I said, if you would like to have a demo on yourself for a specific ad pack or maybe a generic one, then Please feel free. Or if you want to try it out at your uh, facility, then uh, feel free.
feel free to ask questions or have a workshop or I don't know what you what you what you want. You could you could drop me a mail and I can, I'm happy to to provide some some insights and uh, help. Okay, I think I'm over time. No, I'm not over time. I started late. Then you started late. So I'm a perfect in time. <laughs> okay, so more questions or. So there was more in. <laughs> it was a tough question. Okay. Thanks. Thank